What is going on, everybody? How are you guys doing? Uh, I'm I'm releasing another video. Okay, I, I'm I'm trying to get to it. I didn't end up working on the car yesterday. Um, I found if you follow my Instagram, uh, I did find what the culprit of the oil leak that spawned this idea that I was going to tear apart the motor. Um, again, I, I thought I was taking the motor out of the car, but as you guys can see, I am not. And I will go ahead and show you guys the culprit. That is the outer O-ring for the water pump. And the previous one had uh, kind of not been very good to itself. So um, not quite sure what happened there. I'm going to be a lot more careful when I install uh, this new O-ring <clears throat> or when I install the water pump back in the engine to make sure that I don't damage the O-ring. Uh, it's very possible that it was my fault uh, when I was putting the water pump back into the engine. It's very possible that it just went in at a wrong angle and that it tore that O-ring. Uh, it's very important while you're working on engines that you take care and consideration for a lot of things. Um, there, It's very easy to make a very simple mistake that ends up uh, costing a lot of money or a lot of time. In this case, it's only time. Uh, the O-ring was $6. It's really not a big deal. Um, what really would have been a bigger issue is this cam sprocket. It's somewhat odd to work my phone <laughs> as the camera. But uh, this cam sprocket, the bolts had backed out. Uh, again, on the Instagram uh, account, you could see the picture of the bolts that look like this. <laughs> And uh, they had backed out of the cam sprocket. Uh, that it's a variable valve timing vehicle. Um, the cam sprocket can actually shift a little bit depending on the needs of the engine. And this is the bolt that holds the two pieces of the cam sprocket together. There are three of these bolts in there. Um, all three of them had backed out and had suffered some form of damage. You can see the head of the bolt is not in good shape anymore. Um, so I did go ahead and remove all three of the bolts and went ahead and replaced them. The new bolts have been Loctited into place and the cam sprocket is ready to be installed. That's what I'm going to focus on tonight. Um, and getting, <clears throat> and getting the, I, I don't know what the deal is with my throat that I'm having to clear it so much, but I'm sorry about that anyways. Um, the hope is that by the end of the night, I will be able to get the front timing cover back on the engine. Uh, and sealed up. Because of the way that this engine was designed, there is no gasket around the front timing cover. It's freaking massive. Um, which I'm going to try to slide in here. The, all of these, uh, this whole area is covered by a nice big giant cover. And there's no gasket for it. Um, the Subaru factory service manual actually calls for a liquid gasket, which I have ready to go on. I have some new liquid gasket. It's good. We're ready to go for that. Uh, ultra gray, very good with oil resistance, which I thought black was the best, but apparently it's not. Um, I'm fortunate that the last time that I did this, uh, I accidentally used ultra gray accidentally because I wasn't intending to. Uh, I actually thought that I had grabbed black, but when I got home, I had gray, and I just went, meh, we'll see what happens. Um, and it didn't leak on me. I was very happy about that. I didn't have any problems with ultra gray, and then I learned later that ultra gray is actually better for oil resistance than black is. Um, there are a lot of different types of uh, silicone sealers, and some do better for different types of environments. So uh, oil is apparently very good for, uh, sorry, oil. <laughs> Gray is apparently very good for oil resistance and that's a fantastic thing. Some of the other things that I've been working on, um, this is the uh, AC compressor high pressure side that comes from the AC compressor itself. Uh, obviously this is the condenser that I've been working on um, and this is the high pressure line that goes to a legacy. Now uh, this engine actually comes out of a legacy. It is a JDM engine, which means that this, the vehicle that this engine came from uh, was actually in Japan at the time. Um, again, if you haven't seen some of the other videos, there's not a whole lot of information about JDM engines. And usually any kind of information that you're going to get about a JDM engine 
uh, is very, very limited. Uh, and what isn't limited may possibly be a lie. So it's something that you have to be worried about. Um, pretty much if you're going to get a JDM engine, plan on tearing it apart and rebuilding it right away. Um, usually they're advertised to run that they were in running condition uh, and that they should be good to go back into the engine or back into the car. However, you don't know how long the engine has been sitting. In this case, I'm pretty sure that this engine was actually sitting for a while. Um, it The engine itself did not seem to have very many miles on it. And again, uh, the information you're provided when you buy a JDM engine is usually it has less than 50,000 miles on it, which is great in its own right. Um, but they don't typically have a whole lot of information about exactly how many miles were on the car that the engine was taken from. Uh, it's usually so the engines are usually sold to distributors without including that kind of information. So you're not typically going to have a specific answer about how many miles are on the engine. Uh, when I tore apart the car, uh, or when I tore apart the engine, I did find a lot of evidence that this was a vehicle that was wrecked. Um, and what I believe, uh, at least in what I have found on the engine, is, and this is going to sound outlandish, how can you figure this out from an engine, but I, it just is what it is. Um, I'm pretty sure that the vehicle that this engine came from was probably a rollover, um, or it was something where somebody accidentally went off-roading. Uh, and the damage that I have found, uh, or the signs that I have found, indicate that the driver's side front tire... Keep in mind, this is a right-hand drive vehicle, so this would be the U.S. passenger side uh, front, but uh, the driver's side front tire of the vehicle that this engine came from uh, was probably removed from the vehicle with an excessive amount of force while the car was in motion, uh, which is one of the reasons that I think that this was either a roll uh, rollover or uh, somebody accidentally went off-roading. It's very possible that this was a moving accident, but a lot of times when you see a moving accident, it's impacts that don't actually strip the wheel from the vehicle. It, it forces damage into other things, and a lot of times the vehicles very quickly come to a stop. Um, there are exceptions to this. There are tons and tons and tons of ways that vehicles can get into an accident uh, and tons of different ways that that damage can actually play out. So um, thinking that it, it was one of those two specific things is somewhat foolish because I have no idea. Again, I don't have the identification number for the vehicle. And even if I did, I don't think that I would have access to the report of the accident that the vehicle was involved in. That would be very difficult for me to obtain. But I'm pretty sure that this engine has a very small amount of miles on it, uh, or it did before I got my hands on it, and now I'm putting a lot of miles on it, because this is going to be a daily driven car. Uh, and it has been for the most part, except for when I've had it down for repairs. Uh, but anyways, so this engine came from a legacy. The AC, <clears throat> there I go again. The AC compressor um, was uh, did not fit the fittings or the hoses did not fit from the Impreza engine that was in the car beforehand. They didn't quite reach to the compressor in the correct orientation for me to use them on the car. So what I had to do was order a low pressure hose uh, from the compressor to the firewall on the Impreza. I had to modify that hose slightly um, and I do mean slightly. There's a little uh, lever clamp uh, that goes into place. It's, uh, it's actually like a latch uh, on the low pressure hose and it reaches over to the high pressure hose and holds the high pressure hose against the firewall with a bolt that is in between the two hoses. Now the latch, again, being that that hose came from a, lag uh, from a legacy, the hole for the bolt was not exactly in the right position for my vehicle. This engine came from an 05, so when I ordered the hoses, I ordered 05 AC hoses. And uh, it's possible that, especially since the Impreza went through a body design change uh, between 05 and 09, it's very possible and very likely that the Legacy also went through the same body, or through a similar body change. So, um, on the low pressure hose, on that little latch, um, I actually wobbled out that hole a little bit so that it could actually reach to the appropriate location for the mount on the Impreza. It does bolt to its home location. However, because I wasn't able to charge the high pressure side of the system, 
which is why I was showing you guys the condenser earlier. Uh, but I'm getting to that. I'm getting to it. I promise. Uh, because I wasn't able to uh, to get the high pressure hose onto the condenser, um, I never charged the system. I also knew that I was going to be well. I thought I was going to be pulling the engine, um, but. Here's the thing, if I had pulled the engine, that would have meant disconnecting the AC hoses. <clears throat> I decided to not pull the hose, or pull the engine. So you might be thinking, well, you didn't have to pull the hoses then. I didn't have to pull the hoses, or I didn't have to pull the engine, because I had to take the con uh, condenser off anyways. The radiator has to come out for the engine to get pulled. Period, end of story. There's no two, uh, no two ways about that. There's just not enough room to actually tilt the engine and get it out of the vehicle with the radiator in place. Uh, so the radiator had to come out. No ifs, ands, or buts about that. Uh, I wanted to look at the condenser because I wanted to try and figure out why the high pressure hose wasn't fitting. And because it's off to the side of the condenser like that, it was actually very difficult when I was trying to install the high pressure hose beforehand uh, to figure out why uh, it wasn't quite seating correctly. And come to find out, it was the same issue with the low pressure hose. The hole was just slightly off and not in the correct position. So that has been corrected now. The high pressure hose does bolt to the condenser and it is currently bolted to the condenser and that's great. So my plans, Obviously, they were always to include AC. I mean, sure, you might say race car doesn't get AC, but um, this is a daily driven car. I'm going to have AC. Plus, fat guy, he wants AC, so I'm getting it. Um, so after I get the engine back together and get everything running, I'm going to run the engine for about a week or two before I say, okay, everything is good now. Um, I want to make sure that I don't have another oil leak coming from the timing cover. And again, this was actually caused by my prob uh, by my fault. Um, again, I probably damaged the O-ring when I was trying to install the water pump the first time, uh, or when I was building the engine initially. So that's completely on me. I know a lot of people give Subarus, uh, especially this engine, shit for uh, leaking oil all of the time and especially from the timing cover. But I want to express this very clearly. While I initially thought that that was the problem, that I had done something wrong uh, with the liquid gasket trying to seal up the timing cover, I was wrong. Uh, I actually did do a somewhat decent job at doing the liquid gasket on the rear timing cover. And it has not been leaking. The rear timing cover was not the source of the leak. It was that O-ring. Um, this water pump is a part of the timing chain components. And so it's in the front timing cover. Well, the front timing cover is seeped in oil. There is oil in, in between the front and rear timing covers. The oil pump is in there. Um, everything... It, everything inside the timing covers is soaked in oil. It's also a timing chain engine, as I've, uh, I'm sure you guys have guessed that, uh, which means that the timing chain has to be lubricated. So uh, basically, you have a, a pool of oil in the front timing cover, uh, or in the time in between the timing covers. And in this case, the water pump actually has two gaskets on it. You can see the Whoop, I almost knocked that off there. You can see the upper gasket right here and then the lower gasket right here. They are actually labeled as inner and outer O-rings. Uh, uh, and then you also see the weep hole uh, that's right down there. And what this is, uh, the two O-rings and the weep hole are designed to make it so that the water from the... Um, Water pump uh, from the water pump itself doesn't actually get into the oil that's inside the timing cover, and then vice versa as well. Um, the weep hole is uh, basically in a chamber, a static chamber, uh, and it just allows whatever leaks past the O rings to drip out of the engine onto the ground. Um, in this case, because the O ring on the oil side had uh, broken the oil was leaking out of the weep hole and that was the problem the whole time. This was a problem when I went to install the water pump. Um, I'm the one that broke the O-ring, so uh, Subaru can't take any blame for that. That was totally on me. Uh, and the system works. And, and I, didn't, I didn't realize it when I was installing the water pump, what the importance of having those two O-rings was. I knew it was important. It's designed that way for a reason. Um, but I hadn't done the actual research on it. I hadn't really fully looked at it. I just went, oh, it's got two O-rings, whatever, and went on about my day. Um, but there is some significance behind it, and obviously I've, at this point in time, I've figured out what it was for. So, 
A um, lot of things that I need to get done tonight, but I did want to go ahead and release another video. Uh, the video, uh, the engine's going to be retimed. Obviously, all the timing components got ripped off, uh, especially with the cam sprocket that needed to be repaired. I did inspect the other cam sprocket, the other two-piece cam sprocket that's on the driver's side of the engine. Um, that was in good shape. I'm not messing with that. Um, I, I know it seems like, hey, that might be a good idea, replace all the bolts, but sometimes if you decide to take the initiative because you think it might be the best idea possible, what you end up doing is creating another problem. Uh, when you open up a system, when you loosen up bolts and you go to tighten in new bolts, uh, there's a very real possibility that, oh, you didn't tighten the bolts tight enough. Oh, that Loctite didn't work. Um, there are a number of things that could happen because you thought you were doing the right thing and you could create an additional problem. Um, I work in maintenance and this is a mindset that we have to approach uh, with a lot of machines. Sometimes there are things that are just not quite right, but the machine itself isn't broken and it's still running. And those are the times where we have to look at it and be like, don't touch it. You might break something in your attempt to fix it. You might cause further downtime for production. So uh, I'm taking the same mindset to this. It's the engine that I drive every day, so I'm hoping that it is the, <laughs> the, the correct decision to make. But it's certainly the decision that I'm going to make because it's a decision that I make in everyday life, and I'm, I stand behind it like that. Um, anyways, the, uh, <laughs> the unmetered fuel leak, carburetor people will get that joke, uh, the unmetered fuel light, uh, leak from the bad fuel rail that I had uh, from the engine when I got it initially. The fuel rail has been replaced. Um, the upper intake or the intake manifold is ready to go back on, but I'm delaying because it's, I, I kind of like the look of it. Um, and for other reasons, I mean, it's going to make some things easier to get to. Um, there are other things that I have to do in the back of the engine, like running the high pressure hose that actually got removed when I removed the condenser. It's over there on the workbench. Um, that has to go back in and putting the upper intake or putting the intake manifold out. I'm, I'm sitting here thinking about rotary vehicles, man, I, w I miss my RX seven. Um, but, uh, I love the Subaru though. So nobody take that the wrong way. Um, that said, uh, there is some work that I still need to do in the engine bay and putting the up, uh, putting the intake manifold on again uh, is just not very high up on the priorities. It'll probably be the last thing, one of the last things that I do before I get ready to start the car. But since this liquid gasket is going to take 24 hours to cure before I can put uh, oil back in the engine, I need to get to work. I will s hopefully see you guys sometime this weekend. I'm hoping to release another video uh, out driving the car. So we'll actually be on a real camera again, instead of me trying to use my cell phone to film everything and doing one cuts. But, um, I will see you guys later. I hope you have a, uh, I hope you guys are having a nice time. And if this is your first time stopping by, please like, and subscribe, keep, uh, follow the channel. Uh, we're going to be doing a lot of stuff to the EZ30 engine coming up in the future. So, uh, I hope to see you guys around. Talk to you later. Bye.